ready for him. Testing, testing, no, oh, there's the button. Testing. Testing. Any further from the, right here, better? Okay, I'll tell, I'll tell Darren that, not to get too close.
All right, everybody, make some noise if you can hear me. Come on, make some noise. Let's hear it. Are you guys ready for Sunday assembly? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Whoa, that's a hot mic. Welcome to Sunday Assembly Los Angeles. I'm Ross. I'm Darren. What's your name? Darren. It's such a pleasure to meet nice all of you. Nice to meet you. Uh, all right, so we're going to be your co-hosts today. What is Sunday Assembly, Ross? Well, it's a God-free community that celebrates a worldview grounded in evidence and reason. Uh, we invite everyone to join us as we do our best to live better, help often, and wonder more. Now, if there's any empty seats next to you, raise your hands so that people in the back can... Okay, good, 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 good. Excellent. Okay, so look for those hands and go sit next to them. Raise your hand if you... This is your first Sunday assembly. Awesome. Yes. Thank welcome. You. Welcome. We are glad to see you here. We will teach you the secret handshake later. <laughs> oh, we, we came up with those last... Uh, Sunday assembly. <laughs> and uh, if you see someone with a blue dot on their name tag, especially say hello to them because they are our first timers. So, hello. All right, everybody, please get up on your feet. We're going to hear some music from the Evangelicals. All right, this is an awesome, awesome band. They were founded by playwright director Julie Crockett and opera, jazz, and gospel singer Lisa D. And uh, they are an alt country Americana love revolution made flesh for your listening pleasure. Uh, they are a gender-bending, ever-creating force of nature. You're all standing. Let's get some music. Give me some love!
This song has an introduction just to put you into the proper emotional space with which to best enjoy and participate with the song. So we'll introduce it for you. The year is 1984. I want you to picture yourself riding through the night on a dark, dark night on a purple motorcycle wearing leather pants and a poet's blouse with very, very large shoulder pads and, and a pompadour on your head the size of a small animal. See it! See it! And there's a woman on the back of your motorcycle and she's got lace over her face and a very, very exotic name like Vanilla or Ambrosia, or Quebec, and you are in love. Even if it's only for just one night, you are in love as you ride together in the rain. Can you see it? Can you see it? Do you feel it? Are you there? All right, then we can begin. I never meant to cause you any sorrow. I never meant to cause you any pain. I only want to one time see you laughing. Ha ha ha. I only want to see you laughing in the purple rain. Purple rain, 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 purple rain. I only want to see you bathing in the purple rain. I never wanted to be your weekend lover. I just want to be some kind of friend till the end. I can never steal you from another. I am not a thief. It's such a shame. It's such a shame. It's such a shame. Our friendship I do it. Purple rain, 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 purple rain. I only want to see you laughing in the purple rain. Honey, I know, 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 I know. We know times are changing. Time we all reach out for the new. That means you too. Reach, reach, reach for the new. For the new. Everyone, if reach, you're here, reach for the reach. new. Thank you. You say you want a leader, but you can't seem to make up your mind. I think you better close it. I think you better close it. I would like all of you to close your minds right now and let me guide you to the. Purple or rain, purple 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 rain. I only want to see you laughing, only want to see you fading, only want to see you playing, only want to see. All right, let's bring it down so we can hear you. Here we go. Purple rain, 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 purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. A little more passion. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. I only want to see you laughing. Only want to see you playing. Only want to see.
night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Can't follow that. That was too good. I'm All not right. following that. Wow. I oh. kind of want to hear it again. <laughs> that was amazing. Do we have, t no, no? All right. All right, we got to move on to, well, my other favorite part of Sunday Assembly, which is milestones. Yeah. Now, when you walked in, you were asked, hey, is there any milestones that you're celebrating? Uh, would you like to share them with this crowd who will appreciate it? Uh, and yeah. we do have some. Uh, yeah. yeah, I got one over here. Okay. I happen to know this guy. Donovan Wagoner turned 12 on July 4th. Congratulations. That explains all the fireworks. Congratulations. Shirley and Don Robertson celebrated a wedding anniversary. 39 of them. Whoa. Wow. Whoa. Nice work. We want to hear all your secrets. Now, what is your secret? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell us if it's a secret. <laughs> now, does anybody else have any milestones they want to share? Yeah. Happy birthday, Jonathan. Sebastian and Brant just turned two. Happy birthday. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Should we go to a caller? <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I'm celebrating my first humanist wedding next weekend. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations. Now, you can also You're not getting us, married? No. You can say. also let us know if, uh, if you've got bad news to share. We want to we wanna grieve with you or hear that too. Well, hi, I'm Margo, and I want to introduce our friends from Texas. Kim and John flew out to come to Sunday Assembly. So I want you to make them. We're glad you're here. And Ian and I are celebrating our first date tonight. We're going to see the concert that he invited me to 35 years ago, and we're celebrating our 30th year of marriage this year, and we just got back from a really great trip. So that's what's up. Congratulations, you guys. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh. Ooh, good one. Uh, my wife is not here. She was sick, but uh, she just celebrated her 35th birthday this past Sunday. Yes. I remember my 35th birthday long time ago. Fantastic. Well, remember, when you're coming in, share them or share them now. Yeah. All right. So we have some announcements. And actually, this is the time where Sunday Assembly Los Angeles kids get started. So if you have youngins that would like to hang out and do some fun activities, uh, they can meet out in the lobby just now, and then you'll pick them up right after the service. There are fun activities in here, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but for children, there are awesome stuff, things happening We'd also like to thank everybody who brought materials for the Academy Project. Um, we're collecting school supplies today. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be collecting like travel-sized toiletries. Uh, we're going to get together another set of kits for the Sunday assembly line to pass out to homeless people here in Los Angeles. Uh, and actually, this week, we're giving out the, the kits we built before. So if you'd like to help out on Wednesday, we could use some more volunteers. Look on the website or talk to Jeff back at the community table. Raise your hand if you have more blood than you need. We all do. <laughs> there is a truck here that will take some of it from you. <laughs> Anything that you want to give, it, don't go overboard, because that's unhealthy. But give as much as you can. We have a, uh, it's here till 2.30. There's a truck out there. Uh, yeah. Is it the Cedar sinai Yes. Please, help people out. That is uh, something real that you can do to help people in need. Uh, yeah, and you get lots of sweets afterward. That's right. Awesome. All right, now it's time to get to know each other. Oh, this is my favorite part. The icebreaker. Uh, here's what I want you guys to do. Everyone stand, kind of stretch out a little bit. <laughs> stretch out a little bit. <laughs> Say hi to the person next to you. Hey, Darren, how's it going? 
Now I want you to, I want you to start clapping. Good, 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 good. I want you to start cheering. Come on, pump up. Now I want you to start doing it in slow motion. Real big, you guys. Turn to the person next to you. Big high five in slow motion. Now everyone get really angry. Now punch the person next to you in slow motion. Now cheer that you won! And now shake their hand in real time. Tell them what your name is. <laughs> now turn back and see if you remember what their name is. And everyone clap and sit up. <laughs> we, we highly, highly, reco <laughs> we we highly recommend, recommend doing this with, with strangers, strangers on the street. street. It, it works, works every time. time. Every time. time. All right. <laughs> All right, next. 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 Uh, we're we're going to have a speaker, speaker come up for a short performance. performance. And, and you've met Ron Placone, Placone before. He came here once to give a talk. But this time he's going to be showing off his uh, stand-up comic skills. So let's welcome up Ron Placone. Give some love, everybody. All right. Good morning. How are we? I, uh, so I don't know if you guys know this, but here at Sunday Assembly, when they pick the comedic interlude, uh, they try to pick somebody that has something a little bit in common with the theme. And uh, one of the themes coming up in the future is uh, women's sexuality. So uh, despite how little I know about astrophysics, which is nothing, the fine folks at Sunday Assembly assume that I know even less Be why I'm still single, guys, huh? Huh? No, actually, before I moved down here, I was uh, I was engaged. Uh, it did not work out. I'm okay though. I uh, here's the thing: if you're gonna get engaged soon, do not do this. I did this. It is bad luck. I proposed the same day I got the ring. Don't do that. It's bad luck. But I was intimidated. I had that ring, and I was like, "Wow, this is by far the most expensive thing I have ever gotten from the pawn shop." I had to do it that night. And as soon as I heard a yes, I had mixed feelings, so I should have known it wasn't going to work out. <laughs> I did. I had mixed feelings. Like, first I felt a lot of joy that somebody agreed to marry me. Then I felt a lot of sadness at watching somebody I care about make such a crappy life decision. <laughs> well, it worked out. I used to live in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I'm not a religious guy. I don't know if that's necessary to say into a microphone here, but uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm part of the church of I don't know and neither do you, so let's just be nice to each other. That's kind of where I'm at. I, uh, yeah. I'm glad you guys are on board. It never really caught on because our holidays were pretty lame. You know, it was just, <laughs> just a couple people walking around like, I don't know, maybe want to get coffee. That was it. it was I think we need some killer holidays. That's the thing. You know what? Since I'm in a room, a uh, uh, fellow free-thinking folk, that's what we need. We need some killer holidays. I have a suggestion. We got to have a skeptic solstice. That's what we need. That's uh, Dude, every summer in June, we have like three days where we just like, and we give a gift each day, make it a party, you know? Happy summer skeptic solstice. Maybe it's there's a god out there, or maybe it's just a bunch of stories revolving around the sun. Either way, here's an Xbox, Timmy. People would ask me what it was like uh, not being a religious guy living in the South. And Nashville is a pretty, uh, pretty open town. Like, it's pretty live and let live. But every now and again, I would have an experience I was not used to. This woman came up to me once. First question out of her mouth, she goes, hey, do you go to church? 
Uh, and I answered her honestly. I said, no, I don't. I don't have a problem with anyone that does. I just like the NFL and feel like I have enough friends, so. <laughs> and she didn't like my answer. She was like, well, you better pray to Jesus and ask him to change you. And I was like, this, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how to respond. I just looked back at her and I was like, this is the weirdest lap dance I've ever had. It's just a little bit different down there. I don't know. It's just a little. I try, I try to seek the truth. I really do. I, uh, I have read the Bible cover to cover because uh, YOLO. <laughs> I read that whole thing. I read that whole thing cover to cover. And I don't know what I said. I don't know near to you. But uh, I, I do think there's totally a chance that a bunch of rich people made that up so poor people wouldn't kill them. I don't know. But I do think... I do think there's a chance that all, that's all it is. And we don't know, all right? There's a lot of things that we have never seen in our existence uh, as a human species. We have never seen uh, Waters part. We have never seen somebody rise from the dead. We have also never seen rich people lie and conspire to get what they want. So we don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. We, the, the world is crazy right now, and, and I do think that... Uh, that we really need to come together now more than ever. And I, I saw this on social media the other day in response to Orlando and everything that's been going on as of recent. Someone's like, I can't believe people are talking about gun control instead of focusing on the lives that are lost. Focusing on the lives that are lost. I don't understand that. That's like saying, I can't believe people are talking about how to more efficiently run food banks instead of focusing on all the people that starve to death. Like, I just don't get it. Like, it's like, ah, oh, sorry you starved to death. Wish we could do something to help you. Thoughts and prayers. <laughs> That's my one public service announcement I want to give. If you post thoughts and prayers anywhere, you should be required by law to make a cash donation to somebody that's doing something about what you're thinking and praying about. I'm Rob Placone. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Ron. All right, I am really excited about our uh, guest speaker today. She is an extragalactic astrophysicist. So like, you know, you look at those dots in the sky at night. I don't know if you've noticed those. But, like, <laughs> good chance those are from our own galaxy. She's like studying what's outside of it. She's also host of the podcast Everyday Einstein. And she works on ALMA, which is the world's largest uh, telescope in Chile. And she was named the 2014 L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Fellow. Uh, she was also the featured speaker at um, the Sunday Assembly at the Reason Rally in DC. Uh, so we love her, she's awesome. Please welcome up Dr. Sabrina Steerwalt. And today I want to tell you about a breakthrough in our understanding of our place in the universe. A discovery that serves as a cornerstone for mo all of modern astronomy and something that informs the research that I do every day. So how many people here have heard of Edwin Hubble? Edwin Hubble. Is that better? All right. How many people have heard of Edwin Hubble? Okay, well, we're not going to talk about him. <laughs> How many people have heard of William Herschel, discoverer of Uranus? Yeah? Fun fact, in 1781, William Herschel proposed that he name his newly discovered planet George, after the King of England at the time, King George III. So we could have had Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and George. <laughs> but we're still not going to talk about him. So most of us have heard of Edwin Hubble, many of us have heard of William Herschel, who, uh, who recently, hit a man whose contributions to astronomy have been honored by naming a far infrared space base observatory after him that operated until 2013. Now how about, how many of you have heard of Henrietta Leavitt? Some people, but not nearly as many. So Henrietta Leavitt is the reason we know that the universe is expanding. She is the reason we know that we sit in a fairly massive galaxy that looks like a flattened disk in a spiral arm about halfway out. 
She's also the reason we know that 80% of the matter in the universe is made up of something entirely different than what you and I and the Earth and the stars are all made of. Something that we're forced to call dark matter because we still don't know what it is. Now, how can the work of one woman tell us all of that? Well, let me back up. How, who knows why we have two eyes in our head? Is it for symmetry? In case we lose one? Yes, it's for depth perception. So having two eyes, that's fine, shout it out. <laughs> uh, having two eyes gives us two sight lines on objects around us so that we can observe their position relative to the more distant background and judge their distance. Now, astronomers, thank you, Michael, that worked. Uh, astronomers use a technique to measure the distance to nearby stars, a technique called parallax, which is basically a version of having two eyes in your head, but on a spatial scale the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So we measure the position of a star relative to distant background sources, and then we wait six months for the Earth to travel to its opposing point in its orbit. And then we observe the star again six months later, and we see its position has shifted relative to the background sources. Now, parallax may seem straightforward enough. All you need is your nearby star, some distant background sources for reference, and a little bit of patience. But the problem with parallax, or the difficulty with parallax, is that that shift is very, very small. So the closest star to our solar system, the, so the star that gives us the biggest measurable shift, is Proxima Centauri. And Proxima Centauri, the shift is one arc second. I tell you guys are fans of arc seconds. <laughs> so for those of us who don't think in arc seconds, an arc second is the angle subtended by a dime as viewed from two miles away. So, pretty challenging. In the early 1900s, we had figured out that the Earth and the Sun were not at the center of the universe. But we hadn't yet figured out our position in the galaxy and our galaxy's position in the universe. We also had no idea that the stuff that you and I and our Earth are all made of is nothing like the majority of the, the matter in the universe. We couldn't know any of these things until we had a reliable way to measure distances to astronomical objects. Now, parallax was a great tool, but because of the difficulty of that measurement, in the early 1900s, we had only measured the distance to about 60 nearby stars using parallax. So we needed something better. Well, at the time, Henrietta Leavitt was doing one of the only jobs that were available to women who wanted to work in astronomy. She worked cataloging stars. She, her boss at the Harvard, uh, at the Harvard Observatory, uh, Ed, Dr. Edward Pickering, he hired a group of 80 women to do this cataloging work. That group included Annie Jump Cannon, Cecilia Payne, and if you don't know who they are, we can talk about those next time. So it was said that Pickering liked to hire women because he wanted number crunchers who wouldn't do any thinking. <laughs> the, this group of women were known as the Harvard Computers, but also as Pickering's harem. Stay classy, right? <laughs> so luckily for science lovers er everywhere, Henrietta Leavitt did do some thinking. She monitored images of our nearest extragalactic neighbors, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, to look for stars that fluctuated in their brightness over regular intervals. Now such stars, such stars are basically trying to find an equilibrium. So they're trying to balance the gravitational force pushing them inward with force from radiation pressure pushing them outward. But these stars known as variable stars keep missing that equilibrium point. So this results in very easily observed pulsations or fluctu fluctuations in their brightness that vary over periods of days to months. Now Henrietta Leavitt cataloged and monitored over 2,400 variable stars.
That was about half the entire variable star population known at that time. And in her work studying these variable stars, she noticed a particular type of variable star known as Cepheid that uh, showed a pattern. So the brighter the star, the longer that pulsation period. This was huge. So you see, astronomers, we don't always know how far an object is. So when a star appears dim, we don't know if it appears dim because it's actually intrinsically dim, or maybe it's just far away. So knowing the distance to that object, that star, can tell you how intrinsically bright it is. But also, conversely, knowing its distance can tell you, uh, so knowing how intrinsically bright it is can tell you its distance. So basically, Henrietta Leavitt showed that you can take an easily observable quantity, the period of the pulsation of the star, and translate that to an intrinsic brightness using her relation, and then you can know its distance. <laughs> so Pickering, her boss, published her work this period luminosity relation under his own name. <laughs> this was around uh, 1913. Uh, you guys threw me off. Whoa. <laughs> A year later, uh, the Danish astronomer Einar Hertzberg, Hertzsprung, excuse me, uh, calibrated her relationship by measuring independently a distance to some of those Cepheid stars in the Milky Way using parallax. Two years later, Harlow Shapley uh, used her method to measure the distance to several star clusters in the, in the Milky Way to figure out that we were in a flattened disk about uh, pretty far from the center. Now this was a pretty big breakthrough because our previous understanding of what our galaxy looked like so this is a map done by William Herschel and his sister Carolyn, who looked at over 700 sight lines to map out what the structure of the Milky Way looked like. But as it turns out, this is, this is what, uh, more close along the lines of what Harlow Shapley found. And so it turns out that we're not actually that close to the center of our galaxy. We're about halfway out in the disk. And our star is just average. So 10 years later, Edwin Hubble used her method to measure the distance to Andromeda. At the time, we thought Andromeda sat right on the edge of our Milky Way. But it turns out, from Hubble's observations uh, using Levitt's relation, we found that Andromeda is actually more than two million light years away. So the universe is a lot bigger than we thought. And then Edwin Hubble pushed this work to other galaxies beyond our backyard, and he found his own relation. He found that more distant galaxies are moving away from us at faster speeds. So this is the mathematical manifestation of an ever-expanding universe. So not only is the universe bigger than we thought, it's getting bigger by the day. So knowing the distance to a galaxy unlocks a whole wealth of information about the galaxy, including its mass. So if you know the distance to a galaxy, you can estimate its intrinsic brightness, and that can give you an estimate of how many stars it must contain, and thus its mass. So 20 years after Levitt's discovery, she realized, uh, uh, excuse me, 20 years after Levitt's discovery, uh, the American astronomer Fritz Wicke noticed that if you added up all the mass from all the stars, from all the galaxies in the coma cluster of galaxies, it totaled only 1% of the mass that is required to be there to hold that cluster together. In other words, that cluster shouldn't be a stable structure. We should see galaxies flying off in all directions. So Zwicky proposed that there must be a new form of dark matter that exists in the cluster to hold that cluster together. Matter, because it inspires gravitational attraction, but dark, because it doesn't interact via the electromagnetic force like the matter, the normal matter that we know and love. It doesn't interact with us or with our detectors. Astronomer Vera Rubin later showed that the same is true within the galaxies themselves. So stars orbiting in the outer disks of galaxies are moving way too fast to be held there by the mass that's represented by the visible matter alone. 
So knowing the distance to these galaxies helped us understand their, their mass. And so then we could understand that the majority of the matter in the universe can't even be bothered to interact with us. <laughs> so Henrietta Leavitt was known as the woman who discovered how to measure the universe. She's a woman who changed space and time. Her work was so important that the mirror, the size of the mirror on the Hubble Space Telescope was designed specifically to be ideal for measuring Cepheid variable stars. A key project of the Hubble Space Telescope was observing Cepheid distances to 18 galaxies. This was the main focus for the first decade. Every single other discovery was just bonus. So without, uh, without Henrietta Leavitt's work, we would be profoundly lacking in our understanding of our place in the universe. And yet, she wasn't allowed access to research roles. Her boss published her work under his name. Shapley barely mentioned her. It wasn't until 1925 when a uh, Swedish mathematician, Josta Leffler, wrote to Levitt, Levitt and tell, uh, to tell her that her work was so inspiring that he wanted to nominate her for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately, Harlow Shapley, who had become the director of the observatory by that time, had to respond to Leffler to inform him that Levitt had passed away four years prior from cancer. However, Shapley very helpfully suggested that he was the true deserver of the nomination <laughs> because he had been the one to interpret Levitt's results. Now, lest we think that this is simply a thing of the past, uh, all we have to do is look to the stories of Rosalind Franklin, who didn't receive proper credit for mapping the structure of DNA, or Jocelyn Bell Burnell, whose advisor won the Nobel Prize for her discovery of pulsars, these rapidly rotating neutron stars that take nearly twice the mass of the sun and cram it into a space the size of Manhattan. Tw only 22% of PhDs in physics go to women, are earned by women. And that participation fraction only goes down the higher up in the ranks that you go. And this fraction is increasing, but at a snail's pace. And this improvement is only seen for white women, not for any other minoritized group. Now, science isn't the only field where progress for women has been excruciatingly slow. We just happen to be really good at it. <laughs> so what needs to change? Well, as a woman in a male-dominated field, I'm often given advice, usually by my purported allies, on how to be successful. When you give talks to appear confident, stand with your legs a little bit farther than shoulder width apart and your chest out. <laughs> yeah, this is working for me, right? <laughs> Lower your voice an octave so it's not annoying to the male ears. <laughs> Don't ever mention that you have children. Don't have children at all. Oops, too late. <laughs> If you let Greg propose your idea, the director will be more likely to listen. When you talk to the dean, make sure you wear something low cut. So what all of this extremely poor advice has in common is the underlying expectation that I should be the one to adapt. The culture of science has been created, developed, and written by men. So if women want to participate, we have to play the male game and women of color, LGBTQ women, uh, disabled women, they're forced to hide even more of themselves. But as many people in this room know, approaching a problem from diverse perspectives actually inspires more creativity, and it's ultimately more productive. If we want progress to happen, we have to be willing, we have to be able to recognize when we're holding on to constructs of our own making and be willing to let them go even if it makes us a little bit uncomfortable. Ironically, this has been always at the foundation of scientific research. It's just the culture of science that lies far behind. And although slow, we have made progress. 
Not far from here, the Palomar Observatory didn't allow women until the 1970s because they were considered a distraction. And yet I was able to spend many, many nights there and the majority of my dissertation was using that telescope. Women are now principal investigators on NASA missions. We pursue independent research as staff scientists in national observatories. Now I think I have the best job in the world. I get to ask questions about our universe and then try to answer them. But we have so much left to learn about the universe that we need everyone we can get to ask more questions, to seek more answers, and to wonder more if we ever have a hope of uncovering those secrets. So I am grateful to the women astronomers who came before me, and to women everywhere who refused to accept the status quo. To women like Henrietta Leavitt, and Cecilia Payne, and Jocelyn Bell Burnell, I say thank you. Thank you for unlocking these doors so that I can have access. Now let's put a door stopper in there, or better yet, break down those doors altogether. Thank you. That was amazing, thank you. Um, man, awesome. Well, in just an arc second, we're gonna have the even, <laughs> oh, it's not a unit of time. How would I know? I only completed the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs. <laughs> All right, we've got an original song from the Evangelicals. Stand up and sing along. I fell down and broke my arm, but it's all good. I started a fire and set off an alarm, but it's all good. My mama just told me that somebody died, but it's all good. My poor little baby can't sleep through the night. But it's all good. 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 My dog got hit by a car today. But it's all good. Cause Einstein told me nothing really goes away. But it's all good. My old man just walked out on me. But it's all good. Cause it's just some place that he's gotta be. It ain't with me. And that's all good. It's all good, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Cause I feel just like a dog riding in a car with my head out the window and we're going real far and I trust in the driver and I'm letting him drive with my eyes all open watch the world drive by and all I feel is a wind in my face sun shining down and the universe is grace and the sun goes up and the sun goes down and we're driving all over this great big town called good. an assembler to share something about how they're, how they're doing their best. 
Uh, today we have a chance to hear from someone who is always around to lend a helping hand. When we wanted a cocktail hour for winter solstice, he provided a bar and bartended himself. When we realized the night before the Pride celebration that we wouldn't be able to get the marching banners from Sunday Assembly San Diego, he drove all night to San Diego to pick them up after working the booth for a full shift. He also provided the spread that uh, you will enjoy after the assembly today. Uh, doing the best, please welcome Sean Shee. So uh, before I start, I just want to let you know, if I start laughing, it's because I started preparing this while I'm in my restroom looking at myself in the mirror naked, jump between, <laughs> doing jumping jacks. So in my brain, I'm looking at you doing jumping jacks naked. <laughs> but um, to get started, I think we have a lot of people that read books here, I'm sure. Uh, have you ever re read a book where like, you get so enthralled by the story in front of you that you just like, immersed in that world and you think yourself as part of that world. For me, uh, I think of my life as a story in a book that I'm both reading and unfolding in front of me as well as something I'm writing. Now, a good book often has great, uh, very interesting characters. And what makes a character interesting are his or her quirks. I don't think of myself as a very interesting person, but I do have my quirks. One of those quirks that I'm aware of every single day is that I, I choose to sleep in a sleeping bag on the floor. <laughs> Why do I do that? One reason is because in college, every year I mold. And I didn't graduate early. I choose to stay one, one year longer. But beyond that, I moved eight times in Los Angeles, three times in Miami. I moved to Atlanta. I even lived in the Navajo Nation. And you know, just Think of myself, well, I, I gotta start being a minimalist, right? I, if I move so often, I wanna move as little as possible. So if I don't have a bed, that makes it easier for me. But another reason is because I live half a block away from Skid Row. And every time I, I go to sleep, I think about them half a block away from me. Now compared to them, I think I have a great life. But every night when I slip into my sleeping bag, it reminds me that everything that I have can go away in that instant. And I could end up just like the people half a block away from me or even worse. A good book will work in the happiness and the successes that the character encounters. For me, I think I have my successes. In a previous uh, career, over the course of 10 years, I started from a customer service rep and became the president of that company, running the $114 million business and all the successes along the way. Beyond that, what makes me happy is taking photographs. Now, every time I come to assembly, I look at Russ and say, oh man, you must be having a blast. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> because I get this over, like, overwhelming joy when I take a photograph and I get to work on it, you know, the cropping, the filters, and, and everything. And, you know, it, it's like what Henri Cartier Bertrand said, and he says, taking a photograph is easy. It's just a click, but that click is so meaningful. You can be the only person that has captured those people in that space at that moment and from that particular perspective, and that's invaluable, right? I mean, just look at last week, you know, without certain images that were captured, what would happen or not happen? I think um, a good book sometimes will work in the sadness, uh, the negative part, you know, we often think about sadness and depressive things in our life as negative and we don't want to touch that. But you know if you read books, a lot of them are touching because they're touch talking about something depressing, something sad, and it touches you in your heart. For me, one of those was when I was in a hotel room in Paris one night, and my brother in Los Angeles called me and let me know that my grandmother, who was I was close to, had passed away that evening. Um, I realized that I didn't have a chance to say goodbye, and I felt like, oh, um, very sad. And so I, I sat by the window looking at the city of lights and thinking about how she used to live, and she would knit uh, little boots or sweaters for kids sitting at window and singing, 
Another uh, thing that comes to mind is when I found out the moment that my wife at the time was having an affair. And man, that, that heartache that you felt, uh, it's not something that I would wish on anybody to experience. But those are the experiences that over time you look back and it gets easier. And it becomes something that's unique and interesting in your life. I think also uh, if book uh, also shares with you lesson and morals. And for me, one of those lessons that I constantly learn is that life is just full of the unexpected. And so for me, I try not to have any expectations on whatever I do. You know, you, all you can do is prepare the best you can and just let life happen. Let it happen for you. Um, because worrying about things isn't going to help anything. Um, I think uh, if you take that attitude, anything positive that happens is just a serendipity. Right? And so, you know, anything little positive that does happen, it becomes so much better for you. Lastly, I hope everybody will do your best to write your book because you only have one chance at it. Um, hopefully, you take time to go back and appreciate what you've gone through, no matter what you've been through, because it's unique, it's interesting, and I hope we all get a chance to share and listen to your individual stories. But most importantly, make sure you remember that we all have no idea when we're writing our last page. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, I have never pictured anyone doing jumping jacks for that long. <laughs> <laughs> now is the time where we all get quiet and we think about some of the things that were said here today or some of the things that are going on in your life, in your head, and we just want to sit in a room together and reflect and We'll do it with some nice music. Enjoy some peace. reach into your purses and bill folds. <laughs> Take out some money and put it in a box. <laughs> this is our collection time. And uh, <laughs> Sunday Assembly, uh, on average, it costs about $1,200 just for you know, renting the facility and everything we do with snacks and childcare. Uh, so this is a great time that you can help this continue and grow. Uh, and. Uh, so you know, we expect you to raise $1,200 right now. No, I'm just kidding.
please give whatever you can because uh, we have uh, your donation goes directly toward all the venue, all the equipment, uh, all the refreshments. And while your thoughts and prayers are appreciated, <laughs> as Ron said, this is a way you can, you know, one small way you can materially contribute to what goes on here at Sunday Assembly. We also have people with card readers. If you got the credit card, you can hold uh, your hand up. Someone will come by with the reader. Now, if you see somebody who has a green name tag, they are repeat donors who constantly give. Maybe ask them what they do, because there is a thing on, or there's a robot on the website that if you program this robot, it will go into your bank account and pull out a little bit without you even knowing. What is the robot's name? Cecil. I want to meet Cecil. <laughs> Yes, so uh, please, you can do this. Um, do the story checks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please give, we have card readers, we have boxes, I need to. And you can go to, as you said, sundayassemblyla.org, and that's where you can sign up for recurring donations and get a fancy green name tag, and we'll all be like impressed when we see you. <laughs> Nicely done, Ashley, awesome. Oh, box handing around, Darren is helping it move. Gave it all. <laughs> so uh, I was excited uh, to hear that we were talking about galaxies far, far away and uh, empowering uh, women and uh, male oppression, you know, uh, this thing. And I thought, interesting, because my daughter, I have a seven year old daughter, her name is Julia. And she is, you know what, I better preface this by saying that Ross and I work at a very powerful animation company. It's true. That is famous for fairy tales and um, movies uh, featuring princesses and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna preface we that. We won't say what it is. No, no, no. <laughs> An anonymous, powerful animation company here in Los <laughs> Uh, so my daughter is at Disneyland with her friend Samantha, and they're both about, you know, seven. And they are in a store looking at merchandise, and this seven-year-old boy walks up to them and looks at Samantha's shirt and says, why are you wearing that Star Wars shirt? And Samantha's like, what? What are you talking about? Why are you wearing that Star Wars shirt? Star Wars is for boys. And my daughter <laughs> marches across the store and gets right up in his face. And she says, look, and she's pointing the finger in his face. And this is all happening at this level. And she's like, look, the hero of that story is Ray. I have a Ray costume and I'm very proud of it. She is the hero of that story and she is taking orders from General Princess Leia and she is pushing this kid <laughs> out the door of the The kid is sorry that he ever opened his mouth. And as he's running away, she's like, Star Wars is for everyone! So what I learned from this story is that if you need someone to get up in someone's face and tell <laughs> Julia Butters, where did she learn that? That's what I'm afraid of. Where? Where? <laughs> and, and it's not just a women who lose out when they're passed up for these opportunities. It's not just people of color. It's not just LGBTQ people who are left out. It's all of us who are left out because we miss out on our best scientists and our best discoveries our best technologists and our best technologies, our best engineers, our best mathematicians, our best artists, we all lose out on what humanity is capable of. Here's to the best. <laughs> all right, now before we say goodbye, uh, we want the Evangelitals to join us on stage for their final yeah. song. Uh, we're all right, we're gonna have a Sunday social uh, coming up that's gonna be this month, a visit to the California Science Center. So that's uh, next Sunday. Wait, what? Oh, people are just excited. Okay. Yay! Yeah. It's an awesome place, if you haven't been, you should go. July 17th. A great gift store. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that's July 17th, 11 to 2. Sur serving the homeless event in West Hollywood on Wednesday, sign up at the community table in the back or online. That, go to the, go online, guys. Yeah, everything we've mentioned is at sundayassemblyla.org. So happening. go visit there, sign up for stuff, join groups. I mean, there's trivia nights, there's music nights. RSVP for all that stuff. Things happen during the day as well. Uh, and there's um, next Sunday, we're going to have, uh, or next Sunday assembly will be August 10th. And that's going to be with Lyle Tavernier. He's an educational technology specialist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, yeah, what, what part of that was an option? <laughs> the propulsion. And he's going to talk to us about scientific literacy. I just wanted to point out the item drive. Item drive. Uh, so And it's going to tell you what's happening next Sunday, Sunday assembly. Yeah, so this month we were collecting for the Academy Project, and they bring school supplies, specifically journal and school supplies, for children in L.A. who are in the foster care system. So if you brought something today, thank you so much for that. Um, there's a box in the lobby that you can put those items in. Um, next month, we're going to be extending our Sunday assembly line project. We still have some bags that are full that are left over from the last time we did the project. Um, Matt is leading us. I'm joining him this Wednesday to go serve dinner to the homeless and at the Greater West Hollywood Food Coalition. At that time, we'll be handing out some bags, and we invite you all to join us for that. It's a really, really wonderful event. But next, um, as, as next assembly, we'll also be collecting new and unused travel-sized toiletry items for our next a Sunday assembly line, so we can start making some more bags and be ready. So if you can bring those then. We're also going to, do we have a link up yet? No. We are going to have a link up on the next assembly's webpage that uh, has our wish list of the things that we need in particular, and um, we're going to set up an Amazon so you can actually just click and just buy something and have it shipped. Cecil will go and <laughs> bring it to Sunday assembly. Thank you, Gina. Uh, and you can again stick around till 2.30, donate blood. At 1.30 approximately, we head over to the Oyster if you want to get lunch with everybody else. And uh, we just would like to thank uh, Sabrina, Sean, Ron, and our band, Julie, Lisa, Colin, and Danny. Thank you guys, it's been awesome. Let's uh, hear one more song from them. <laughs>
another round of applause, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you to all our speakers, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. And remember, until next time, live better, help often, and wonder more. See you next month, guys.